would you say that the, the pace of our career development, our personal development also depends on uh, the mentors that we have? Oh, I, I, well, first place, if you, if you read The Inner Game of Selling by Ron Willingham or you read The People Principle by Ron Willingham and you, and you grasp his concept of the three dimensions of human performance, which he basically created as a result of, of, of working with uh, Maxwell Maltz, who wrote Psycho-Cybernetics, what you'll, what you'll uncover is that the key to all growth and development is number one, self-awareness. Most of us don't have great self-awareness because we don't have people sharing with us views that we can't see. And so, so my belief is that the catalyst for, for significant growth and development is almost always a good coach. Yeah. I'll give you an example. When I was 37, my life's dream, they got to understand, you know, I came from a family where my parents were married nine times. My dad was bankrupt three times. You know, my stepfather pulled a gun on me twice. You know, I grew up in a uh, you know very broken uh, family, and, and 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 we didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so, my life's dream at 37 was to be a regional manager for a pharmaceutical company. And I figured, hey, if I could make that by the time I'm 40, and then do that the rest of my life, I'd have it made. Well, when I was 37, I got the opportunity to to uh, to interview for a regional manager job. And there was only two candidates, me and my last boss. And either he would be working for me or I would be working for him. And so anyway, he gets the job, not me. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because the day he got the job, Tim, he calls me. He lived in Tampa, still does. His name is Don Cutcliffe. Uh, had as big an influence on my life as anybody. And he comes to me and he tells me this. He said, Jerry, you should have got this job, not me. He said, you're far more qualified to do this than I am, but they didn't give it to you. They gave it to me and I ain't giving it back. Uh, he said, but let me tell you this, this job is not big enough for you. You need to be running our company. And I promise you tonight, I will not stop advocating on your behalf until you're running our company. And five years later, I was running the company. But you see what he did, Tim? He changed my view of me. Right. See, my view of me was I'm a regional manager. Yep. That's my self-image. Yep. What he forced me to think about was, could I actually go to New Jersey, compete with these people, and wound up in a significant role, which I did. And, and I wound up as vice president general manager of a you know, $650 million pharmaceutical company. None of that happens without him. And so the answer to your question is, if you want to experience exponential or significant growth and development, you got to get a great mentor who sees in you what you do not see in yourself. Yeah. There are times when you think back and you say to yourself, I wish I had a mentor at that time. I could have seen yeah. myself from a different perspective. You know, on All Out Coach, Jerry, I have a video where I talk about why all of us need uh, coaches and in fact, multiple coaches yes. maybe two or three different coaches for, because of how diversified our world is becoming. Yes. And skills are, and, and I need to get a coach experience. to explain to me my 20 year old, whatever, whatever generation he is, I don't understand it. <laughs> I looked over your website again, Delta point. So it used to be called Delta point uh, back when I was at AstraZeneca and when we knew each other. And uh, I'll just mention to the listeners that it's just rich and dense with, success stories, similar to the ones you just shared, uh, success stories, as well as practical tips, references, books, uh, where you help marketing teams to launch products, a lot of co corporations. Well, I want to ask you, what are some of the most trending problems that you're asked recently to resolve uh, from these large, industry, uh, large companies? Well, they fall into three different categories. Uh, number one, <clears throat> a lot of companies ask us to help them take a brand and grow share. Now, it's either because they're getting a new competitor or they think that they're, they're leaving you know, market share on the table and don't, haven't figured out internally how to do it. And we've done 100, I think, in 78 of those uh, in the 19 years that we've been involved. We did 20 of them at Merck. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think we did 17 of them at AstraZeneca. <clears throat> and so we get hired to help them figure out how do you sell more of this stuff. And so we spend lots of time, lots of effort, lots of energy trying to understand the product, the therapeutic category, et cetera. Now, we, don't, we also have done that for, you know, companies that are not pharma. Uh, 
I mean, we've done it for big companies like Hertz. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big part of our business. The second part is, you know, new companies um, or existing companies who want to have a customer focused approach. They will ask us to create their selling approach and then their coaching approach. And we do that for probably, that's probably 25% of our business. And then the rest of it is workshops where people have an individual issue. The, 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 the two, the three biggest ones are, you know, how do we become more interesting so we can get more people to listen? Uh, the second one is how do we ask better questions? Uh, because regardless of whether you're an MSL or whether you're, you know, um, well, even if you're a physician, the quality of the questions you ask determines the quality of care you can get. And then the last one is, uh, you know, how do you actually ask for commitments? Now, we also do a lot of work on relationship building because I've written three books on that. The relationship and, edge is one of them, right? That I remember. The relationship, the relationship edge, edge, yeah. But and it's all the same version of the same book with just sort of some new material. But mm -hmm. but a lot of people really don't know how to build a network. They don't know how to leverage a network. Uh, and they certainly don't know how to build a relationship with somebody that they don't naturally connect with. And so the whole purpose of the relationship edge, I mean, you and I don't need a book to build a relationship with each other. We naturally connect, yeah. but there's probably 75% of the people that you and I interact with that we don't naturally connect with. And if we could naturally connect with them, it'd probably be a good thing. So I wrote the books to teach people, how do you connect with people you don't naturally connect with? And then how do you maintain those relationships how do you sustain those? And then how do you leverage them? Because leveraging relationships is probably one of the things that most people really don't understand how to do right. Mm -hmm. um, they, know, they know how to do it, but Jerry's view of the world is if you do it the wrong way, it, it's counterproductive. So if I say, hey, Tim, do you know John Smith? You're going to say yes. I'm going to say, will you introduce me? Well, now I've put you on the spot. But if I say, hey, Tim, how well do you know John Smith, if at all? Right. And you say, well, actually, I, I know him pretty well. And then I say, well, how comfortable would you be introducing me? It now, requires follow-up questions. It's always that depth, that added dimension and depth that you always brought, uh, Jerry, just, just like in that, that example alone. Yeah, but I think it's, a, to me, everybody needs to learn how to ask that question because yeah. There are people that are in your, in, in your circle that know people that you need to know, but they are not mind readers, so they don't know who you need to know. I was trying to see a, a physician uh, when I was back at DM in Alabama, and you know it was, it was in charge of Medicaid, and he wouldn't see me, and he wouldn't see my rep. And so I just asked everybody I knew, how well do you know this guy, if at all? And well, the 10th person I asked said, I know him really well. How comfortable would you be introducing me? He said, let's call him right now. Mm -hmm. So literally I'm standing in this OBGYN's office. He calls this, you know, family practitioner who's a hundred miles away and said, Hey, I want you to talk to this uh, pharma guy. And let me just tell you right now, he's different. He's not like the rest of them. Yep. And um, so I got on the phone with a guy and he said, Hey, if, if Ron says you're okay, you're okay. When can you come up here? I said, how about tomorrow? I went up there the next day. And by the time I left, I had all of his preprinted orders. Mm -hmm. And he is a lifelong friend of mine now. Yeah. So my point is, if you know how to, to leverage relationships and you know how to find people, like I wanted to meet the basketball coach at Arizona State because my hobby is mentoring college basketball coaches. Right. And I wanted to meet the coach at Arizona State when I, when I you know, and when, you know, because I have a home in Phoenix. Yep. And this guy is the fourth youngest coach in the history of college basketball to 400 victories. And I didn't know him, but I wanted to know him because I love college basketball. And so I just asked everybody I knew, how well do you know Herb Sendak, if at all? And finally, the 10th person said, I know him really well. You want to meet him? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we'll have, let's have breakfast next week. So I had breakfast with Herb, and this has been 11 years ago. And um, now, if, if you do that, you better make dang sure that you have a reason for wanting to meet with him. Because if they don't ask you why you want to meet with him, they're thinking, why does this person want to meet with me? So sure enough, Herb is a very straight shooter. And he says, so what, what, what do you want from me? And I said, I don't want anything from you. I said, I got enough money to buy my own tickets. I don't even like your t-shirt, so I, I wouldn't want one of those. Um, I said, let me tell you what I want. 
I said, I want the opportunity to get in front of your 15 basketball players, and I want to teach them two things that I'll guarantee you, you're not teaching them and your school's not teaching them, but it's critical to their life success. Mm -hmm. He said, well, what's that? And I said, how do you set and achieve stretch goals? How do you do extraordinary things? And how do you build a network of people so you'll always have a job? I said, so let me ask you this question. You got 15 people in that locker room. How many of those people are going to be able to make their living playing basketball and never do anything else? He said, none. I said, so every single one of them sooner or later are going to need a job. Well, I said, well, if you don't have a network, you ain't getting a job. So he said, well, look, could you talk to them tomorrow? <laughs> said, yeah, I could. Now, what I love about this story, because Herb is a close friend of mine, uh, if you go on jerryacuff.com, yeah. There's actually a minute and nine second video of Herb talking about our relationship and how much he values our relationship. And what I try and get people to understand is that if you know how to do this, you can take someone who's, who you, you have no relationship with to someone you have a really valuable relationship with if your intent is good and you can add value to them. You know, the biggest thing that we encounter is companies are too product focused. Mm -hmm. or they're too sales focused. They're not customer focused. I'm a big believer that you have to think like the customer. And, um, you know, I always say to sell Jane Brown, what Jane Brown buys, you have to see the world through Jane Brown's eyes. Yep. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why one of my most valuable, uh, you know, colleagues is a physician. And so when I'm creating sales language for clients, he edits a hundred percent of them. Why? Cause he's a doctor. And if I say, you know, patients with metastatic breast cancer, uh, I mean, if I say the, 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 the you know, the med metastatic breast cancer patient, he'll change it to the patient with metastatic breast cancer. Right. Because that's how the physicians talk. And so, I, I mean, he's, he's one of the most valuable resources I have, but it's because I understand that the only way I'm going to get through to people is to think like they do. Now, the other thing I've, that I've learned is that the vast majority of people in our industry, and whether it's sales or marketing, they don't ask very good questions. They don't ask the kind of thought provoking questions that gets the customer to see that maybe there's a fit for our product that they haven't thought of before. Mm -hmm. And so, and if you, and if you read, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's only two great books in, in that I've read about questions. One's called, uh, questions that sell by a guy named Paul Cherry. He's yep. a friend of mine and I'm actually, you know, in version two, I'm actually on the back cover of that book. Okay. Um, and, and I don't endorse it because I'm on the back cover. I endorse it because when I read it, the first book, I said, this is fabulous. And then, uh, then our, then the other one is spin selling problem with both of those books. And, and Paul would acknowledge this. They don't teach you how to create your own question. Mm -hmm. They give you lots of examples of situations and questions you could ask. Mm -hmm. What we teach people is how do you actually sit in a Panera Bread or Starbucks yep. and create a question for whoever you're going to call on, whether that's me calling on a senior executive in a pharma company or whether that's a sales rep calling on a doctor or whether that's, you know, somebody from Hertz out calling on a body shop uh, trying to get their business. Yeah. How do you actually create the question so that the person wants to answer and answer truthfully? And there's a dearth of that um, in, in our industry. And then the other problem, I think, is that a lot of the senior, and I, I probably get shot for saying this, but it's true, um, a lot of the senior salespeople are disconnected from the customer. And so they have this belief that we'd sell more if we challenged the customer. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to tell you, you take the average pharmaceutical sales force I'd be betting that certainly half or more to have a liberal arts degree like I do. Now, if you think I with a bachelor's degree in English and a 2.18 GPA is going to go challenge a physician, you're out of your mind <laughs> because I'm way smarter than that. Now, can I, can I, can I challenge their thinking by asking good questions? The answer to that is you damn right. I can. Can I get them to extend what they're thinking by asking something as simple as say more about that. Can you educate me a little bit more on that last point that you brought up? Yeah. Um, but most people, you know, they just come in and try and ram the stuff down your throat. And this is, you know, we're the greatest, 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 greatest. And, you know, if I, 
if I were a customer, I'd get tired of you telling me how great you were. I mean, I tell, you know, I tell my clients, especially in competitive markets, the worst thing you can do is knock your competition. Yeah. What you have to do is to say, look, both of these products are great. The question is, if the products are similar, but they're not the same, then the question becomes, what are the differences and when do they matter? And I think a lot of, another thing that we see, and this would be the only thing I would add to it, is, is some companies are great at paying attention to culture. And, and some of our clients are not. And so if you have a very sort of, you know, dictatorial, uh, you know, hierarchical culture, it's not going to be nearly successful if you create a family environment. And I can tell you, you know, there's, there's a half a dozen great companies, I mean, really great companies that create great culture. And the culture what, what the culture does is that number one, it frees people to be themselves. The second thing it does is it attracts good people. We got clients who have lousy cultures and, you know, and now if I encounter somebody with a bad culture, then I try and tell them you got a culture issue. And so if you're trying to get me to be the answer to your problems, I got to tell you, I'm only part of the, the answer. You got to, you got to deal with the culture because culture has too much negativity in it. You know, Malt said in his book, Psycho-Cybernetics, that the most negative energy you can apply towards the attainment of a goal is the pressure you put on yourself to achieve a goal. And so if you're putting pressure on people, all you're doing is creating negative energy. And far too many companies do that. 